Hello, welcome and welcome back. This is Jacob and today we are going to be continuing the narrations for the memory mappings in IS-3, aka Mizuki and Cerulean Arbor. And of course, before we begin, the usual reminder that the different memory mappings, including endings number 2 and 3 in this game mode, and I'm not counting ending 4 because it has not been yet added, are all parts of what-if scenarios, different timelines and events, all pretty much depicting a different kind of struggle against the Seaborn and their advance. For more on that, if you have not had the opportunity yet to experience, read and see those different endings and the different memory mappings, uh, in the description of this video you can find two playlists for both of these things, so if you want to see them, they are right there. Now also a quick note before we begin with this one, uh, at the end of this one, I will add, uh, or rather, I will ask a question of you guys for um, maybe ideas, because uh, I do have questions regarding this one specifically, and I will go into more details once we finish the story. So for now, let us begin with memory number four, titled Starbound Bubbles. And it reads here on the left, Perhaps there will always be an impulse urging us to cast aside gravity, and the bonds to home chaining us down, to throw ourselves into the sea and the starry skies. Memory Selection Part 1 The girl wakes up from the dream with a start. The starlight in her dream lingers in her mind. How long has it been since she started traveling and studying with Grandpa Bishop? The girl finds it difficult to trace the passage of time, for her life is divided into the time before she witnessed the starlight and the time after. She believes that she is awake, serious, determined. If there is something that can prove the value of life, validate the truth of her thoughts, she will reach out to it, embrace it. Grandpa said that not everyone walks the same bridge, nor is it a privilege to walk that bridge. Humanity's possibilities are infinite. All means are merely tools, and it is the end, not the means, that should become the object of worship. He always preached, rec he always preached recognizing what one truly wants to do and become, and refusing to accept easy, simple answers. But I have seen my path, it lies before me, the opportunity of a lifetime. The pact that Grandpa made with his old friend lies silently in the box. Grandpa must have run into trouble, because he has not been back for two days. One more day and this hideout and everything here will be destroyed, as he arranged. But none of this matters. Its pulse and breath guide my heartbeat. It is salvation that I had long sought but never received. Reach out, open the box, drink the pact of the ocean, and I will return to the day when time stopped and rebuild myself with the starlight reflected off the surface of the ocean. If the starlight is too bright, then I will go blind for it. Part number two. The girl wakes up from the dream with a start. The starlight in her dream lingers in her mind. She looks at one hand, and the other, and the other, and perhaps the other too. She finds that they and they are scooping up handful after handful of starlight. How could it be? How could the starlight that was so far away be so easily grasped in her hands? The joy is intense. She subconsciously spreads herself out and begins to spin and dance. The stars seem to understand her joy and begin to dance in orbit around her, even without... without music? It should not be so. Limbs are rhythm and starlight melody. But why is there no song? Is there no instrument? No, no. Why is it dark? Why does the starlight not shine upon here or upon me? Why is it not warm? Is it because it is dry? Do the limbs not feel warmth because they are dry? Does the throat make no sound because it is dry? Then look up and call for rain. Drown out the noise and sing one last song. Warm musical notes fall from my hide one after another, transforming into a shining, translucent melody, wrapped in bubbles 
of every color. I will become Starlight. Part 3 The girl wakes up from the dream with a start. The starlight in her dream lingers in her mind. Highmore feels no cold, even though she lay on the deck and awoke to the soft and cool touch of the night. Perhaps she never fell asleep. One let her consciousness drift for a moment. Only let her consciousness drift for a moment. It has been too long since, since she desired sleep from physical fatigue. The blood and flesh of Seaborn have made her song strong and resilient, and virtually eliminated the need for sleep, but the mind does not acclimate to the long waking hours so quickly. What if the starlight in the reverie did not come from beneath the surface of consciousness, but from the tangible sky above? She dreamt of the starlight countless times, but she does not recall the last time she looked up at the starry sky. When was the last time? All she can recall is that the gloom in Iberia's skies never seemed to scatter. Highmore remembers a story her parents told her in her childhood. Iberian, Iberian once hoped to rely on these stars to navigate the seas, but were frustrated by the mystery of the starry heavens. Starlight seemed to have no discernible pattern, and some occultists even suspected them to be reflections of or premonitions of events on the ground. It was only when some of the Aegir came on land with their technology, working with Iberia to build lighthouse after lighthouse along the coastline to guide the navigation of ships, that Iberia forsook gazing upon the stars and conquered the seas. Am I no different from the home that I detested? Blinded by the inscrutable stars lost in the arms of the ocean and... A thought comes to Hymor's mind. She stands up slowly. Lighthouses light the way home for lost ships. Perhaps it is why they attracted sea terrors and were the first to be destroyed when the tide came. She would not let this happen to her next home. So, the question I would like to pose here, and uh, we kind of went over this when I live-streamed uh, IS-3 at the beginning of the month when this was added uh, on stream as well, but uh, it is kind of a bit vague to uh, read through this, or rather to depict when this is taking place, because it kind of feels like it could be both a sort of retelling of events of ending number one, like the beginning section here does feel like it's uh, the beginning of her becoming the Seaborn. That slight spoiler, we do fight at ending number one. Uh, however, she does obviously turn back into a human, and more on that, why certain people can become uh, and remain in human form, even though their cells and being essentially are Seaborn. Uh, more on that in ending number one and the text endings that follow that. Uh, however, uh, in the later parts, it does seem like it might be a complete what-if scenario, like the beginning might uh, weirdly overlap with what we know about Highmore from ending number one, aka she becoming Seaborn, having ties to Cicero, yada yada, all of that. Uh, however, from part number two onward, it seems like to be a completely different scenario, depicting like uh, her remaining Seaborn, but then all of a sudden realizing that something is missing, something is not there, th this is not right, I will, I will do this my own way. A.K. Uh, she rejecting the thoughts uh, of we many, essentially, <laughs> essentially fighting back against the Seaborn uh, on her own terms, and turning back into a human. Because she, here she literally gets depicted with the name Highmore, which means she is back to her old self, uh, and she stands her ground now against the tide, against the Seaborn encroaching so it does kind of feel like it starts off like it could be ending number one uh, scenario but then it depicts uh, a similar kind of thought pattern where she just turns back into a human or rather maintains her human form above a seaborn and uh, becomes an individual again empowered by the cells that she now now has and what she is and is now standing against the tide of the seaborn protecting uh, what seems to be potentially the last lighthouse <laughs> 
uh, in Iberia, and we all know that one. Uh, but yeah, interesting. I would like to hear uh, you guys' opinions on this one. It does seem like a weird mix between both uh, actual timeline of events that we know from the actual uh, canon that we follow, but also depicting the what-if scenario uh, where things just go slightly different once again. And once again, a reminder that the what-if scenarios of uh, this game mode might be different timelines, events, and stuff like that happening. There are still, there are still, uh, in when it comes to lore building, pretty canonical to just the World of Arknights. They're still just using the same assets, but in different, different kind of ways. So don't, don't just completely dismiss uh, stuff that is being told in these what-if scenarios. It could come back. Uh, in uh, future, uh, in future uh, side stories, because uh, we are not done yet with the Seaborn. Oh no, we are not. But yeah, anyway, uh, that will be it. So I would like to hear you guys' opinions on that. Like I said, and uh, of course, if you like this video, please consider leaving a like on it. It would help me a lot. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. And as of recently, there is also a channel membership as well if you like to join. However, I will say that uh, I will always remind people that. The membership will not bar you away, oh, sorry, if you don't pick up the membership, it will not bar you away from anything, it is purely there to just directly support the channel. That is all. And thank you very much. And I hope you have a fantastic day wherever you are, and I will see you in the next video. Until then, bye bye.